Hello everyone. Guess three times what's in front of you right now. Alright, I won't keep you in suspense, it's a fully autonomous, fairly lightweight, and compact device for spot welding batteries. Not too long ago, a video was released on the channel where I showed a homemade welding machine for battery spot welding. I highly recommend watching that video because today will be a continuation. Let's briefly look at what our little device consists of. Traditional battery welding machines look like this. They are built on the basis of an iron transformer, bulky and tethered to the power grid. My version, in terms of welding quality, is almost as good as a factory one, but it is completely autonomous, meaning there's no need for a power supply. To be fair, I should note that factory machines have extended functionality and are capable of producing a series of sequential pulses. Our version doesn't have this option, but it still welds quite well without it. The circuit consists of several parts. A battery with a protection board, an ionistor or supercapacitor battery with a balancing system, a step-down voltage and current stabilizer, and a switching or delay system. Let's start with the last one. This part consists of a series of powerful field effect transistors, which are controlled by an NE555 timer chip. But not directly, through a driver. The concept is simple. We have a powerful battery, and when we press the button, the field effect transistors are activated. The power from the battery goes to the welding point. The welding time can be set from 50 milliseconds to 1 second by turning the variable resistor. Here's the most important point. When we press the button, the pulse goes for the set time, regardless of whether you release the button or not. One press, one pulse. Everything is just like in an industrial machine. Such a system guarantees high-quality welding, meaning the process is, you could say, automated. During welding, the corresponding indicator LED on the board lights up. The board is quite compact, everything is on SMD. The transistors will operate in key mode, so they won't heat up much. During welding, huge currents will flow through them, so it's worth using low-voltage field effect switches with the lowest possible on-state resistance. And with a current of at least 40A. Pulse short-term current from 200A. Here, the more, the better. The driver on a complementary pair ensures reliable control of the field effect transistors. I have already shown how it works in the corresponding video. In the circuit, we have two power sources, a main power source and a separate low power source needed to power the control system. This solution is due to the fact that during welding, voltage drops are possible on the main battery. And if the control is powered from the main battery, due to these drops, the circuit may not work correctly. That was the backstory and a quick introduction. Now, let's get down to business. I got my hands on these capacitors with a voltage, rating and a capacity of 500 farads each, and I decided to use them as the main power source. Here is the complete schematic of the device. The capacitor bank, where a lithium-ion battery 3S2P, is used as the power source at. Volts or Volts when fully charged. The batteries themselves are almost not involved in the welding process. The voltage from the battery, through a step-down pulse voltage and current stabilizer, charges the capacitor bank to a value of A in. The charging current is limited to 8 to 10 A, but it can be increased. And our switch or timing system with field effect transistors. The lithium battery is equipped with a protection system without a balancing unit. The balancer will be directly on the charger for these batteries, which I will make later. I wanted to add a force discharge system for the capacitors, just a regular lamp and a switch. Finished the work and went about our business with peace of mind. Later, I abandoned the system because a powerful lamp is needed for a more or less quick discharge of the capacitors and there's nowhere to fit it. Yes, and everyone will find a way to discharge the capacitors. I, for example, use an 8-volt bulb at 150 watts. Before examining each part of the circuit in detail, I'll answer the question, why? Use capacitors. Can't we just use a regular battery? You can, but you need a battery that can briefly deliver currents of 300 to 500A or more. For example, model polymer batteries, or a pair of batteries from an uninterruptible power supply, or a car battery. 
But in any case, the key feature of capacitors is their very low internal resistance. Therefore, they can deliver huge currents, and that's normal for them. And the lifespan of capacitors is very, very long, unlike any batteries. Well, now let's examine the construction in more detail. The capacitor battery initially consisted of six capacitors connected in series. They were all located on a single board. On the same board, there is a balancing system, or voltage equalization for the capacitors. After numerous experiments, I decided to dolder all the capacitors from the original board and assemble another battery, where two capacitors are connected in parallel and three assemblies of two cells are connected in series. Considering that in a series connection the internal resistance decreases, and in a parallel connection it increases, our battery has a capacity of about 330 farads and an internal resistance of only half a million. The voltage to which the battery can be charged is Volts. Other configurations of connecting these specific capacitors did not yield the desired result. Naturally, one could use more advanced capacitors, but I was content with what I had. The original balancing board is designed for six capacitors connected in series, as I already mentioned. Therefore, I simply cut it in half. Next, I cleaned the solder mask from the power planes, tinned them, and soldered the capacitors on the sides. It looks unusual, but beautiful. Next, the switchboard was soldered onto this entire structure. The power wires used are multi-stranded 8AWG in heat-resistant silicone insulation. The length of each conductor is 20 centimeters. The terminals are brass from a hardware store. The electrodes are made from copper wire with a diameter of 3 millimeters. The start button is connected to one of the terminals and is located right under the thumb. Step down, regulator. It charges the supercapacitors. This regulator is necessary because the voltage from the batteries is higher and the supercapacitor bank needs to be charged to a voltage of IN. In my case, the charging current is limited to 9A, but it can be set to 20 or even 30. I just didn't have a powerful regulator. I didn't really want to build one from scratch. I tinkered with it a bit. In my junk, I found a couple of regulators on XL4015 chips with a maximum current of 5A. I didn't have any more powerful ones. To increase the total output current, I had to connect a couple of these regulators in parallel. Of course, it's not ideal to do it this way, but it's possible if there's no other choice. The regulators are connected in parallel at the input and also at the output, but not directly, instead, through decoupling diodes jokes, and low resistance resistors for current balancing. In general, balancing resistors can be omitted if the output voltage and current are identical for both regulators. But practice shows that the output parameters can slightly fluctuate when the boards heat up. That's why I took precautions. The regulators were installed on a separate large board. Resistors and diodes are also installed on it. In the circuit, I used one more powerful step-down regulator. The shock key diode prevents current from flowing from the supercapacitors to the stabilizer board. The setup is done before connecting the supercapacitor battery. Place one probe of the multimeter on the cathode of the shock key diode and the other on the ground. By turning the trimmer resistors, set the output voltage. IN. Next, set the multimeter to ammeter mode. And by turning another trimmer resistor, set the maximum current limit to 9 to 10A. The shock key diode must be mounted on a heatsink. After the setup, the screws of the trimmer resistors were sealed with hot glue. The variable resistor responsible for the welding time was brought out to that large board. Next, an analog scale was made. It shows the welding time. Set the required time depending on the thickness of the nickel strip, and off you go. Having an oscilloscope on hand makes it easy to determine the pulse time at specific positions of the variable resistor. A digital voltmeter was added to the design, which shows the voltage on the supercapacitors. First, let's charge the supercapacitor battery almost fully. Then, we'll discharge it using an electronic load and battery test mode to determine the capacity of our supercapacitor battery. We won't fuss over the discharge current and we'll set it immediately to 10A.
After a few minutes, the battery is completely discharged, delivering a capacity of 460 milliamp hours. But this is considering that we didn't initially charge the battery to its maximum value. At a total of 9A, the process of fully charging the supercapacitor battery takes about 3 minutes. Some might say, how come waiting 3 minutes just to weld one battery? No, you won't have to. The energy stored in the supercapacitors is enough for 20 welds at average hold times. But while you weld one battery and move on to another, the system will have time to recharge the supercapacitors. So, even if you weld at an incredible speed, the supercapacitor charging system will always keep up with you. And the supercapacitors will always be ready to work. I forgot to mention that in my case, the stabilizers charge the supercapacitor bank not to the maximum volts, but to volts. This decision, you could say, is not based on anything specific. The minimum hold time, with the components specified in the diagram is 50 milliseconds, and that's enough for proper welding. The maximum hold time is half a second. Such endurance might be required for welding, for example, nickel-cadmium batteries from a screwdriver using a thin nickel strip, or for welding various tin cans. Many are probably curious about the meaning of the current during welding. Let's try to find out. We'll assemble a simple circuit from a current sensor. In my case, it's a 10 current shunt. Yes, it's a bit low, but the measurement is short term and in theory it should hold up. The resistance of the shunt is milliohms or ohms, 1 or 6 times 0 0.0075 ohms. An oscilloscope is connected in parallel to the current shunt. It will record the maximum voltage drop across the shunt at the moment of welding. The vertical division value is 2V. The maximum drop across the shunt. N. Considering the shunt resistance in milliohms. According to the law, we get about 360 to 370 amps of current. Not bad at all. And finally, let's see how the device performs in action. I fed the whole time to the minimum. The tape is the most ordinary nickel. As we can see it welded firmly, when trying to tear it off, part of the tape remains on the batteries. Well, to sum up, thanks to the use of supercapacitors, the device has become very lightweight and provides a high welding current, which allows welding fairly thick nickel strips. We managed to eliminate the auxiliary power source for the control system, as supercapacitors are involved in the welding, and the current drawn from the batteries is stabilized at 9 to 10 A, meaning there won't be critical voltage drops. Autonomy, compact size, and weight, what more could you need for complete satisfaction? Few people know, but I have reworked and refined this circuit multiple times. There are a total of four videos on the channel dedicated to this circuit. I think this video will be the last one. In the future, I will make a simple case. Maybe. Otherwise, it's kind of scary. A random piece of metal or an unfortunately dropped screwdriver could short something and cause trouble. There are a lot of exposed traces here. I also plan to buy a specialized holder for the electrodes. Well, I guess it's time to wrap up this video. I definitely recommend replicating this design. Yes, financially, such a device is not cheap, but it was worth it. All necessary links can be found, as always, in the description, including a link to the project archive with the printed circuit board. But for now, I have to say goodbye. As always, this was Kazuya Naka with you. And that's all for today. Goodbye.